And I'm going to go ahead and get us started. All right, so I think I think everyone to joining the Zoom event who is joined now. Um, welcome virtually to Green Apple Books on the Park. We are located in San Francisco in the Sunset District. My name is Jeff, um, and I will be your host tonight. Um, as you may know, we regularly host events every week um, here at Green Apple Books. Um, if you want to tune in to our schedule, you can check out our website, greenapplebooks.com, in our events calendar. It has everything we're doing. We also do some events that are not in SOAR. We actually just recently had, um, we were selling books from multiple authors at the Sunset um, Swap Me, I believe, right down the street from us. So that was really cool. We also have um, an event coming up in the Botanical Gardens. So that will be very exciting. Um, yeah, you can check out everything on our website. Um, and after we're done recording every single event that we do, they'll be available on our YouTube channel, which is just Green Apple Books. So tonight we are thrilled to welcome Navaz Ahmed and Nina McConaughey in celebration of Navaz's new novel, Radiant Fugitives. Um, we have plenty of cop copies available in store. Both are both our Clements location and um, here. So if you want, you can pick those up here. You can also order those online to pick up. Um, we appreciate your support of our events and of the authors that we host. So it would be really great to support them. Um, so uh, right now, I'll let you guys know that if you want, you can utilize Zoom's Q&A box at the very bottom while our authors are talking. Um, they'll be able to answer your questions at the um, after they are done speaking to each other. So just be aware of that. Um, so yeah, Navaz Ahmed was born in Tamil Nadu, India. Before turning to writing, he was a computer scientist, a researching search algorithms for Yahoo. He holds an MFA from University of Michigan, um, Ann Arbor, and is the winner of several Hopwood Awards. He's the recipient of residencies at McDowell, Yado, Desirazi, and VCCA, sorry, VC, VCCA. <laughs> He is also the Kundaman and Lambda Literary Fellow, and he lives in book, Brooklyn currently. Nina McConaughey was born in Singapore and grew up in Washington, I mean, Wyoming, not Washington. <laughs> She's the author of a number of short stories and a play. Many of her stories have appeared in a number of books, and her most recent short story collection, Cowboys and East Indians, was the winner of, the pen, of a Pen Open Book Award and the High Plains Book Award. She's the winner of the Barthelm uh, Memorial Fellowship in, non, in nonfiction and has served as the nonfiction editor of Gulf Coast, a journal of literature and fine arts, and currently teaches at the University of Wyoming. So without further ado, I want to welcome both our authors, Nevez Ahmed and Nina McConaughey. I'll leave it up to you guys. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, I would like to give a little bit of an intro um, because um we met and we were trying to figure out what year i think it's 2007 2008 2008 i think 2008, 2008. Yes. We, we met at the bread loaf writers conference and we bonded right away over chennai and just our shared family backgrounds but we um also i you know i think we both were very kind of young writers then neither of us had books and um and yet I knew there was something special <laughs> about Nawaz when I, when I um, met him and heard some of his work. So this is such a pleasure for me to be here tonight, um, also because I, I'm crazy about this book. So um, I, I, I feel like a lot of my questions tonight are sort of writerly questions. I know a lot of people who are here probably haven't read the book yet, um, so you're in for a treat. But um, I, I kind of wanted to start by talking to you a little bit about, with a, with a broad question. And this is out of my own curiosity, and um, I think for a lot of people here, which is how the book came to be. Um, was it a novel that you'd been thinking about for a long time, or did it start with a character that you maybe, that came to you, that you couldn't shake out of your head? Um, or was it place that made the foundation of the book? You started thinking about a place or a memory. So I just really wanted to know how the book came together and and what got the novel started? Thank you, Nina. But, I mean, both to Green Apple and for you for that lovely introduction. I mean, uh, we did meet in 2008. And I don't know if you remember it. I actually read 
a paragraph from this, what would eventually become this book at that conference in 2008. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't the book at that point at all. It was not. Okay. <laughs> it was, as I said, a paragraph. And it was a scene um, that I had woken up with that summer before I came to Breadloaf. And I had written the, had this wonderful scene that and the line and I'd woken up and I remember writing it down almost immediately. And the scene had two sisters you will recognize it from the book, had two sisters sipping tea and one of them is very pregnant and her mother, the dying mother is asleep in the adjacent room and there's so much tension in the air. Um, and that is the scene that I wrote and that was almost just a paragraph there. This was in 2008. Um, and I think there was something about that scene that didn't let go. If that's what you're asking, like, how did it begin? There was this wonderful scene and um, a voice that seemed to want to be heard. And I didn't know who that voice was yet then or what the story was about these women, except that there was some huge amount of tension between them and there was this dying mother in the background. I also knew at that time, I think, that it was kind of set in San Francisco. Uh, because I was living in San Francisco at that time. Um, so that is how this novel started from this very little scene. And after that, it was just almost a process of exploration. Like who were these women and why, why couldn't I let go of them? In between, I had some other ideas of novels that I wanted to write said in Hong Kong, there was something I wanted to write said in London, but these women and maybe the fact that I had at that time in 2008, I was applying to go to an MFA and so I was leaving San Francisco in a year. So I think having left San Francisco made it feel like there was something I was still clinging on to. I think maybe I was in denial about having to leave San Francisco. And so there was something very nice about trying to write a novel set there. And so the Hong Kong novel and the London novel never happened. And what did happen over the next 10 years was these three women, a novel about these three women, and turned out to be more than these three women, which is why I think I couldn't let them go. Um, yeah. But th that's so interesting. I mean, obviously, we're reading for you know, this event is for a, a bookstore in San Francisco tonight, Green Apple Books, which is very iconic of, of San Francisco. But obviously, you didn't grow up there. That wasn't the place you had. It wasn't a place that you, um, you know, it wasn't your where you were from, so to speak. I guess I say this because I write a lot about where I'm from. Um, so what is your sense of place? And I guess, why did you I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but why? Besides just leaving, what was it about San Francisco that you thought, okay, I'm going to set the novel here. It's going to be based here rather than in Chennai or in another. I mean, obviously, Seema couldn't have traveled back pregnant, but why why San Francisco? And why do you think San Francisco makes such a great backdrop for this story? One thing I have to say that though I wasn't born in San Francisco, it was the longest at that time when I left San Francisco, it was the longest I'd actually lived anywhere. And in India, I actually lived in various different places, a few years here, a few years there. And none that I really thought of as home, because home for me was where my parents lived. And they lived in a place that didn't have good schools. So I actually never grew up at home. I grew up with cousins elsewhere. So I think the home that I had in San Francisco was what I, at that time, really considered home. And San Francisco was also where I kind of came into my own. It was the place where I came out, found a community for myself. There was a South Asian uh, LGBT community, Tricone, that was that 
kind of welcome me. And San Francisco is also such a powerful, I mean, the history of San Francisco as far as LGBT rights go, it's, it's like, it's where the action was. In fact, while I was there, I mean, we had the whole set of things that happened from 2004 to 2008, which I wrote in the book about. So I think for me as a gay Muslim immigrant that San Francisco became that kind of iconic place. I mean, there is this phrase that people use, the gay Mecca in a way, and people come to San Francisco as a pilgrimage of sorts, at least queer people. And so that's what I think San Francisco felt like for me. And so it seemed, uh, it seemed like the right thing to do. And the novel was, as I said, conceived in San Francisco. Hmm. And it seemed to me like the women were there in San Francisco. They, yeah. No, it makes it, It's interesting because even in the opening scenes, in the prologue, like the fog and other things become such, they almost become characters and the place really, it feels, it feels very place driven to me in, in a lot of ways. And I, I love that I, I, as someone who's only visited San Francisco and it doesn't, doesn't, you know, has never spent a lot of time there. I, I got a real sense of the place in a, in a way that I, um, and the weather and just, you know, small things. Um, so I, I, th I think we'd love to hear a passage now, now that you've sort of set up how the book came, how the book came to be and uh, talking about San Francisco, I'd love to love to hear you just read for a little bit. Okay. Um, what I thought I would do for today is to read what that scene actually became in the final draft, that one paragraph that I had started off with. And so it grew into this other thing. So I thought I would read from that. Um, this, I don't think I need to actually set up much for it. I mean, the novel's about two sisters, Seema and Tahara, and their mother, as I said, their mother Nafisa is dying and she's sleeping in their adjacent room. And so, yep. Do you want some tea? Seema says. Chamomile for Seema, black for Tahara. Caffeine no longer affects Tahara. The many long nights in Irvine have taken care of that. Tahara's night starts after her children go to bed. The dishes, the laundry, the tidying up, the next day's meals, everything she can do so she'll have more time with her family during the day. The previous week has been particularly exhausting. She cooked enough meals to last her family two weeks, labeling packets by day, week, and person, gave the house a thorough dusting and cleaning, typed up and stuck lists, reminders, and phone numbers to the fridge door. All this, apart from squeezing as many patients as she could into her calendar at her clinic. Opposite her, Seema sits engorged, scott fingers clasped around the cup, her face still unlined, as if her 40 years have left little mark on her. She appears lost to the world, sipping her tea and stroking her pregnant belly with a smile of contentment and accomplishment, which Tara knows from their childhood days, so smug and untroubled, while the dying mother sleeps in the next room. How's Ami? Tara asks, despite her resolution not to discuss their mother. Seema rouses herself. The chamomile has begun to relax her, and the sensation of tautness and solidity as she moves her hands over her stomach has its usual comforting and stabilizing effect. The kitchen, even with Tahara seated across the table from her, glows with a languorous warmth. She's not been sleeping well. I found her awake the other night, sitting here in the dark. I'd gotten up to go to the bathroom and she wasn't in bed. I heard these weird sounds, like a mouse squeaking. I thought she was crying, but no, just hiccups and jet lag. Has she said anything at all? She's been telling me about her school days. Seema and Nafisa talked for almost three hours that night. Did you know she used to recite poetry like you? Urdu poetry. She wanted to be a poet. Used to write and sing ghazals. How come she never sang for us when we were growing up? 
Against the light, Tahra looked surprisingly like Nafisa, the same shape of the head poised bird-like over the same small frame. Sima notices other similarities, the thin, tight lips, the thin nose, the thinning eyebrows. Sima is also reminded of Amina, who she, grows, who she knows will grow up with a strong resemblance to her mother and grandmother. You two look so alike. I hadn't noticed before. I haven't seen you together in so many years. It makes me happy and sad at the same time. Why? Tahara asks. What makes me sad? Sima repeats. Isn't it obvious? She suspects in Tahara's question a suggestion that she has renounced all rights to her family. Over the phone the last two months, the sisters have discussed mainly the logistics of Nafisa's visit. When, where, how. Tara is consulted with her father and other doctors in Chennai and is a doctor herself, but she has remained tight-lipped about her mother's condition, answering Seema's queries with curt, cryptic replies. Seema has since stopped asking. What she knows, she's gleaned from Nafisa and by consulting her physician friends. You know Ami doesn't have much time, right? Of course I know, Tahara says. They haven't talked about it. There's nothing to talk about. Did Ami say how long she's going to stay? No, and I haven't asked her. She can stay with me as long as she wants. She's aware of Tahara's eyes boring into her, but she can't resist the taunt like with the chicken neck earlier. The room feels charged again. My mother returns to what she knows will calm her, placing her palms on the shell of her body around me and taking deep breaths. Just to interject, the narrator is the baby, Seema's baby, who's going to be born. She slides her palms slowly around the dome of her belly, naming parts of me she thinks she recognizes. Elbows, knees, skull. The security in the promise of me. But Tahara's anger is growing palpable. What? Seema says, without looking up. I've read her case reports, Tahara says. She shouldn't have come. Seema puts a finger on her lips to remind Tahara of their mother sleeping in the next room. But the gesture infuriates Tahara further. She stands up, face clenched and lips quivering. It was very selfish of you to ask her here. What happens if she suddenly becomes worse? Will you be able to take care of her? Seema struggles to rise. Why are you upset with me? I didn't ask Ami here. I tried to convince her not to come. She wanted to. She pushes herself off her chair with a jerk. I didn't ask you to come either. It happens in a flash. She stumbles, the chair totters. She's falling backward. And for a moment it seems that the world is swiveling out of control. She throws her hands out, seeking purchase on the tabletop, but it's smooth. In her panic, she's sure there's to be no reprieve for her. Ishrah, she calls out to me in her mind, as though she can warn me to safety. Who or what saves us that first night? Is Tara flinging herself across the table and grabbing Seema by the arms. The momentum brings their heads together with a crash that resounds in the kitchen. Seema sits down with a gasp. The world slowly rocks back into place. I'm sorry, Tara says. She hurries over to Seema's side. A bruise is already beginning to show on Seema's forehead, but she turns away as Tahara reaches for the spot. Let me see, Tahara persists. She bends down, blowing on the bruise, much as she would on her daughter, Amina's. For the second time that day, Seema pushes her away. Let's see about setting up the futon. Ami is sharing the bed with me. I'll get you pillows and a blanket. In the living room, Tara insists on making up the futon herself. She wants, no needs, the futon to be uncomfortable, the blanket inadequate, something of a penance, something to erase from her memory the image of Seema's paralyzed face as the chair teetered, something to expunge from her mind the thought that accompanied it, however fleetingly. In the instant before she threw out her hands to grab her sister, she had wanted the chair to tip over. She had imagined Seema arcing back, her head striking the floor. Even the Isha Namaz cannot quite eliminate the guilt and shame that burns her now.
this is a new section. Oh, grandmother, you're not asleep yet. The voices from the kitchen are no lullaby. Your daughters are fighting and you blame yourself. There must have been something you could have done before the rifts widened to such chasms. It's your elder daughter you're agonizing over. It's my not yet born self. Who's there to care for us? You abandoned Seema when she needed you most and you won't be there when she needs you again. You have little time to make amends, a few months, perhaps a year. And there's little you can do for Seema now other than purge with Tahara to take back her sister. But Tahara is stubborn, like her father. How unbending she has become over the years. Sequestering herself behind her hijab and her five times a day namaz. You're afraid you no longer know how to reach her. You're afraid you have failed them both. You pretend to be sleeping when Seema returns to the bedroom, turning away when she climbs into the bed so that she can, as she's been doing the last few days, snuggle into you, into you her belly pressing into your back, one arm resting on your waist. This connection is precious to you. Three generations, mother, daughter and grandson. And somehow its very existence gives you some hope, the sense of life persisting and persevering. There is tomorrow, even if there are not many more tomorrows for you. Or right, I'll stop there. Thank you. So we were talking earlier in the week, I was going to say it's it's a very interesting experience. Um, for those of you who are, are in the audience, I'm five months pregnant, which you would see if we were if we were actually um, in San Francisco right now. So it's very interesting reading a book. I mean, I think for anyone that the fact that the narrator is the unborn child is is such an interesting move and it's felt even more interesting for me because I I have an unborn child in my belly as we speak, but I, I want to talk to you about the narration because I think it, it is something really unique about the book. Um, and I know for me as a writer, the point of view um, and the voice feel like the most, one of the most important choices you make as a writer. Um, I know I'm working on a novel now and I've had three different drafts with three different points of view. Um, so I, I think many people who have read the book so far have commented on your narrative choices. So how did you think about voice with the novel and, and how did you come to this narrator that, that you have? Um, yeah, um, just one correction. I mean, the narrator is a newborn baby because- Yeah, that's true, sorry. From yeah. the, he speaks from the moment of birth. Right, He's just sorry. Been delivered he hasn't taken his breath, first breath yet, and yeah, so and he speaks from that moment. Right, sorry, um, but he's unborn. So he, a lot of the, a lot of the book, he while well, things are happening. Yes. Correct. He narrates the one week that led up to his birth and all the events that happened there. Um, and the narrator, to me, was a godsend. I. Since that one scene, as I said, I had written, and then I was trying to make it a novel, and the novel just wouldn't flow. The reason being, I think, and this may also be a writerly reason, but um, I had these three women, and I knew I wanted a consciousness that they all be represented in the book. So it wasn't just going to be just the story of one of them, it would be story of all of them and um, so I had to find for myself a way of narrating the story about the three women and at the same time I think I also had which now is very deep in the book in fact towards the end of the book a first line one of the lines that I'd written um, when I first wrote the book and I knew it just it it was that line that did not let me go, and it was a voice that was poetic and prophetic, and I didn't feel it belonged to any of these three women. It just did not, and so there was this mystery like whose voice is that, and how can I write this entire book with this voice without knowing whose it was? And um, there were also other things I wanted from this voice. I wanted because there's so much 
tension between the sisters and between the mother and all the rest, I did not want this voice taking sides. I did not want this voice to be judgmental. I did not want, I wanted this voice to be accepting of these three women. And it seemed like a puzzle to me, like, wait, what am I to do? How do you get to this voice? And I remember running in Michigan during my MFA, puzzling over this question. When it suddenly struck me that if I made Seema's baby, the one who's not yet born, the one that we see in that scene, the one where Seema is stroking her belly as a narrator, then it would solve a lot of the problems that I had. Like this baby, since he's not yet fully formed, his voice is not yet fully formed, would be accepting and judgmental and he's more curious than trying to judge. He wants to learn more and uh, about these characters. And in a way that also mirrored me, like I, I wanted to know who these characters were and what was happening to them. I didn't know what they were, why there was all this uh, tension between them. So it felt like the baby's journey of finding the voice would be mine too. And so, as I said, it felt like God sent. The very next day, I went back and rewrote the beginning with the baby's voice. And miraculously, the novel flowed out of that. There was really nothing that stumped. There was, I mean, it took a long time to get the voice right eventually. Because one of the things I did know after the first few drafts is that I didn't want the voice to be just a passive narrator. I wanted the baby to be able to grow from the moment he starts to the moment uh, to the end. And so I had to find a way in which this baby, through the narration, actually grows. And that, I think, was the work of several drafts, as to how do you map the growth of a voice without actual events. There's no events other than the ones he's narrating. And that I did, I think, by figuring out when these other influences and maybe we'll talk about that, like Keats and Obama and um, the Quran and how they slowly come into his consciousness and how he, hopefully at the end, he has fused them all together into his voice. I mean, that leads into my next question beautifully, which is, you know, you talk about marriage equality. It, that's something that's in the novel. And there are several um, mentions of historical historical and real things. I mean, we have Kamala Harris, we have Obama, it's set in a very specific time in the Obama administration, um, the Affordable Care Act, all these real historical events. And I'm just sort of curious of like, how does history inform your writing, especially this is this is recent history, you know, this isn't stuff that happened. It isn't partitioned. <laughs> so um, I just am I'm curious of how yeah, what were those choices about? Or what were you thinking about? These, um, I had these two characters, Seema and Tahara. And, um, and to me, I felt like, and they were not in India. I mean, they, I had set them particularly in the US. And, um, and when I started this novel, as a novel, it was like 2010. And we had come off with a pretty big victory in the sense of Obama's win, but already, and there was so much hope in the air at that time. There was, and already at that time, by 2010, it felt like some of that hope was crumbling because by 2010, it felt like we, the house would lose its majority, Obama may not get anything done. And then at the same time, leading up to the elections in 2010, there was so much anti-Muslim sentiment in the country. There was these huge ground zero mosque protests going around, I mean, in New York City, and it seemed to be spreading everywhere. Also, in 2010, we had all these states rushing to include uh, same-sex marriage bans in their constitutions following like the 2008 uh, Prop 8 in California. Um, so it seemed like my characters 
could not avoid it. I mean, how do you write about living at that time without talking about what was happening in the country? It, it just seemed like I could not make a small domestic drama. These outside forces had to, not only really had to, they must have impacted these characters. And so I think I began to conceive of the novel at that time, not just as this tiny domestic novel about the three women, but also how they fit in America and how does America impact them. Um, and I'm assuming America, because that's where the novel is set, but I also felt like the forces that were happening in America were also being replicated in so many other countries as well. So it didn't feel like, it felt like a very urgent thing to do. How do these political forces influence our lives? And how do we make sense of it? Um, that started this other threads in the story where I really wanted to bring the world into the book. And it was a slow process. I think when I tried to do that, more and more of the world kept getting into it. It was like hard to keep out. It's like, okay, this is happening too. Shall I put this in as well? And the novel did grow. It grew from my initial draft of like a 120,000 words to like 200,000 words at one point. That's like an 800 page novel. And I was like, what do I do with it? Thankfully, my editor knew what to do with things like that. So, <laughs> yes. So that's the start. And that's where I think all this, um, the events of the world, I wanted to just make sure that those events got into the book and somehow affected these characters. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting because beyond sort of big historical events, you have these smaller references, or not smaller, but you have other references like the Quran. And also, um, I was really intrigued by my senior, my senior year, my senior English project was on the romantics. Um, I remember hearing my first Keats poem. Uh, um, I knew I was going to be an English major from that. Um, a professor read to Autumn to us. And my mom always told me stories about memorizing Wordsworth when she was in Madras as a child. And she she talks about memorizing I, I wandered lonely as a cloud and how she didn't even know what a daffodil was <laughs> like that wasn't a that wasn't a flower that happened in it where they lived um and I also love some of your other British references like Edith Blyton um but my own relationship uh, to the to the poetry I think that I read as an undergrad became um sort of fraught I, I teach post-colonial yeah. now sorry dog um and I you have these you have there's a lot of Keats and Wordsworth and and references to the Romantics and and the Quran and other or the like other poetry and I'm just sort of um, and, and I think the characters have especially Thara has a, has a complicated relationship to poetry so I'm just curious about these choices about why why the poetry <laughs> <laughs> just um, just to note. Um, I too had to memorize <laughs> wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over waves and hills. And all at once I saw a crowd, a host of lovely daffodils. Mm -hmm. I remember that even now and and this is like what 20 years, 30 years, <laughs> years later. <laughs> um, wow. Um, Daffodils, yes, I did not know what a daffodil was, but we did, we did memorize a lot of the British romantic poets, a lot of, I mean, that's partly because I think, just like Tahara and her sister, I too went to what they call, what we call a convent school, an Anglo-Indian school, which took its um, syllabi, syllabus from, I think, British lineage. Um, so poetry. I am, I, there's this few lines in the book and maybe I should just read that as to where the poetry comes from because there is a speech that that father gives in a high school about poetry and why he thinks it's very important. So I thought I'd just read those couple of lines just to talk about why I felt I needed to put it in the book. If 
and this is from his speech. If life is a picture, then poetry is a faint flickering light that illuminates it, he says. If life is a lamp, then the stirring overlapping shadows it casts all around us are poems. We cannot apprehend the one without the other. And the poet is life's prophet. Um, I think to me, poetry and maybe the sense and then by extension, maybe art of various kinds, music, are these intangible some things that we crave in our lives that try to capture spirit in some way. Prose, I think, to a lesser extent, and I'm a prose writer, and I really admire how the poets do it. And I think, um, for me, it is that, that's what the poetry in the book to me represents, is this intangible something that we are all aspiring to that seems to capture meaning in some mysterious way that we don't completely understand. I mean, you can go and try to parse out the poem and say, okay, this is where this particular sense is coming from. And But we don't read prose that way. We read poetry that way. There's something compressed and, uh, and there's a lot of space for people to hang their own interpretations. And um, in that sense, I think poetry also felt like a scripture in a way, like the Quran and the Bible. I mean, they are also very poetic in the, the ways they work and in the ways um, the voices of those pieces of the Bible and the Quran work. And so I think I saw poetry as this other secular way we could still grasp for the unknown. And I wanted that, that in the book. Like, how do you, what do you, rep, what do you replace religion and faith with? If you take away religion and faith, what do you replace it with? And I think um, that's a big question for me growing up Muslim and then trying to, okay, there's not much about queerness in most Islam. So what do you do? Mm. So this question, and not really for me, I mean, there are so many who have to, who have like, we all have to figure out what we do in this post God moment, if if there is, if we have that. And so I think poetry. I brought poetry into the book to kind of capture that and to deal with that. In a, you can't. It's very hard to write about music or art of other kinds. I don't know. There are some wonderful writers who do it, but poetry is at least words and and we could grapple with that. Um, I think when you mentioned the post-colonial part of it, I, I did, did also worry about it. Like, why am I talking about the romantic poets? And, uh, and why is this British colonial heritage still something I'm grappling with? So I made it a point, I think, then to make sure I brought in these other kinds, like the Khazals and um, the Urdu poetry that the mother Nafisa has somehow loved and had to give up on. And so I'm, so those, I think, were my ways of trying to, okay, I'm just not really talking about the romantic poets or about English, Western poetry. I'm talking in a more general term of things we try to give meaning to. No, and, and the mother in comparison to the father is so interesting to me in, in the book because she has her own knowledge and, and expertise, but which is kind of not as appreciated. I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me. I, I, I love the mother. Um, I know we don't have a huge amount of time before we open it back up to the audience. I don't know if you want to do que more questions or read another small passage or what would be your, your feeling right now? How much time do we have? Um... You know, they're like five minutes before we have to open it up to the audience. Maybe questions then, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'm curious, you you did talk about, um, you already sort of talked about this a little bit, but um, we had been talking about mysteries and talking about sort of um, structure of books when we've talked before. And I was sort of wondering, is this book kind of a, it's not a whodunit or a mystery, but you do know from page one that a pretty major 
and I'm not spoiling anything to say this, um, from page one, we know a pretty major character dies in the book. And um, did you make a conscious choice to sort of structure the book that way? Um, were, were you worried about forecasting that so early in, in the book? I mean, um, first of all, the, I'm a huge, I, did we talk about it? I'm a huge fan of mysteries and I grew up, I mean, as part of the same colonial British heritage, grew up reading a lot of Agatha Christie. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you could yeah. avoid it. <laughs> so, and that's the kind of writer I wanted to be, which is this um, writer of murder mysteries. And so we do have a death right in the beginning of the book. And then there is not exactly a mystery, but there is a real question of uh, how, how did it happen? Or, and even maybe who, what, how? Um, and I, I think, felt like that was something I knew how to do like have this journey that goes to the end. So knowing that in the beginning, I think gave me a place to go. Because as, I, as you've said, and as everybody knows, this is my first book and I had to pretty much teach myself how to write. I mean, my entire background before that was in computer science and reading murder mysteries and, it was, and maybe some of the classics. And it was only after I went to a, do my MFA that I actually read a lot of the other books. Um, so I think structuring the book has a sense of this book will slowly reveal what happened was a very good way for me at least to deal with that question of what do you do with a novel? How do you write it? And um, and I also think murder mysteries have this very uh, wonderful uh, inbuilt uh, framework. People know what to expect and they know why they're reading and and keep people reading. You want to know what happened. And that's that's more than can be said for so many books. It's like, oh my God, here's at least a way. And it also, as I said, allowed me to write. I had something to write towards. So, yeah. No, I mean, my heart rate was up from page one and I thought, oh, wow, this is not okay. And, you know, it definitely, you want to figure out what ha happened and what, how we got to that point in the beginning. So it's, I mean, I, structurally, I think it was so smart and, and as a reader, it just really draws you in. I mean, you're, 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 you're on board from page one of, 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 just trying to figure out this family. And I think, um, I don't know, I'm, one of my last questions I think would be um, thinking about family and thinking about this. I think of this as a very American novel. I think because so many, I don't know, because the Obama presidency and just place and just so many things about it really feel um, so rooted in, in sort of the, I don't know, the, not the American dream, but what we, it, it really is rooted in who, being who you want to be. And I, I'm sure a lot of people, I guess I'm asking this question kind of personally, um, will ask you about being an Indian American writer rather than American, you know, we're always, we always get that hyphen. Um, and I'm, it sometimes feels kind of problematic to me, but I'm curious to know, like, do you think about audience when you write? Did you have a reader in mind? Um, do you think about those labels at all when you were writing or, or is that just too, if you think about it too much, is it just too? No, I mean, of course, I mean, I am, we are living here and I'm writing, uh, writing in the U.S. So, and I do want my book read in the U.S. as well. So it's hard not to um, grapple with these questions. Um, to me, um, one thing that, as I said, when I was writing is it's so easy to dismiss a book as this is about immigrants, not about America, not about Americans. These are this, these are these 
weird little exotic little people with their own whatever and this really doesn't we would like to learn about them but this is not about us and um and that's something i didn't want this book to be i didn't want this book to be say this is not about america no this is about the people here are are grappling with the same things that so many other americans are grappling with if you take i mean what is happening with half of america i mean this is a very divided country and i was writing about a very divided family where issues of faith sexuality all those were playing out not just in the family but also i think within the country and i didn't want it to be just looked at as these are about muslim immigrants and not about our country we don't have to think about it we can read the book put it away and forget about all of that um so 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 writing about america i think was definitely important to me as far as audience goes on the other hand the, the person i imagined reading the book as um there is this um was actually I did have an intended audience which is my mother because in a way she is not living in the US she is in India and she knows nothing about the US or very little about what is happening here so i think in trying to write the book there were so many things that she didn't need ex- explanations about she knows knows everything about sima and taha i mean maybe about tahara and nafisa where she would have less knowledge about is Seema's life itself as a queer person and also what does it feel like to live in America with all these events happening here and so i felt like i needed to put those things into the book in enough detail so that my mother would understand so you, so that you would actually say this is what the um, um i'm blanking on the obama care the acronym for obama care but anyway this is what obama care fight was about and so i had to make sure that it was something that she would be able to understand and not just be so there were all those details i really felt like i needed to capture what was happening in the us for my mother so that she as an outsider would be able to figure out without and not just uh, skip over all those parts yeah so no that that makes that makes total sense and i i yeah i'm all i'm always so curious about the question about audience i feel like that's one of the, i don't know why i feel so interested with every yeah. writer but who, how they answer that because some people are very broad and some people are very specific that it's i but i i also my mom is often my first reader so um i i feel you but I guess we should open it up to the audience now. I know we have one question already. Um, so anybody else in the audience, please, the Q&A box is at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen and feel free to ask questions in this like 10, 15 minutes that we have um, to just open things up. Um, otherwise I'll, <laughs> I'll ask, I have a lot more questions. But um, one of the first questions was, is there an audio book in the pipeline for this, for this book? I believe there is um we do have I think we just selected a narrator for the book maybe a few weeks ago and I hope that it will be coming and Dan I see that my editor has replied already it should be coming out very soon yep great um again you can also ask in the chat or you can ask in the q a otherwise i'll be bossy and ask ask more questions because i have a lot of them still for is there any other audience questions sorry to put everybody on the spot <laughs> well while people are thinking i will ask another question um because I selfishly can do that as the oh no there is a question okay sorry 
Um, well, okay, someone asked what's next for you. And that actually was, that is my question as well, um, which is, are you, what's next? And are you thinking about a new idea or work? I know that seems like a very exhausting question, maybe after just finishing a novel, but <laughs> I, I had the same question. So what next? Um, while finishing this book, at least the last years, I think one thing that I kept clinging on to was this hope that I could be done with this book and then I would start these other books that I wanted to write. And, and so I think I was doing this kind of, uh, what do you call, a little bit of adultery, thinking about this fast, thinking about and fantasizing about these other books I would write. Um, so I had a couple of ideas. Um, but turns out that now that I've just finished this book, I'm quite exhausted and I'm not yet sure if those are the ideas I want to commit months or years and probably years of life to them yet. Um, the thing that I'm thinking of is I want maybe something that is as different from this book as I can think of. Maybe something shorter. Maybe something like <laughs> that, that doesn't take 10 years to write and uh, is not so heavy. Um, yeah, I still haven't hit upon that something, but yeah, that, that's my fantasy right now is that there'll be this miraculous idea that would be like small and, and lovely and would make me be a joy writing. Not that this wasn't a joy writing, it was also a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of pain. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think that's, I, 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 someone who has been working on, and I just finished a novel a draft, I can say, you are, you are, you're doing it for so long. It, it feels like even if you want to stop, if you start hating it at some point, you have to stick with it. <laughs> you can't, you can't, well, I guess you can abandon it, but um <laughs> A little painful to abandon. Um, does anybody else in the audience have a question either for the chat or the Q&A? Maybe have time for one or two questions more. Otherwise, again, I have another, I have another quick question. <clears throat> it feels like my, my, in my class, the same thing happens. And there's always, it actually is always a weird pause. I feel like teaching on Zoom has been just verbally, people are like, what? No, not ready. Um, yeah, I guess I will ask another quick question then, um, if, if that's okay, which is um, all the three main women characters of the book, Seema, Tara, and Nafisa are very sharply defined, I think in very different ways. They're, they're pretty different. Um, and you write about these women so complexly. Um, Though I think through them you explore a lot of things like race and gender and religion and sexuality. Um, and I guess, can you talk about that? And maybe it's a complicated question, but are they different? Are they representing different facets of women? Or how did you sort of, I mean, I know you say the book sort of started with you thought about these sisters having tea and the mother dying in the other room, but I just sort of am curious about even the choice of having women, women. Yeah, um, I have, um, I think part of that stems from having been brought up by these incredibly strong women back at home in India. Um, my mother was one of the first doctors in a little town and I had, and her sisters were these incredible pioneers in various different ways. And um, I brought, grew up in families with a lot of female cousins. And I think partly being queer, I did spend a lot more time with them than I ever did with the boys. I think the boys intimidated me at that time. Um, <laughs> so the women I felt very much at home with. And um, so I think writing about that kind of a community that the that the women had, which also could have a lot of tension too. I mean, it's not like just because um, so was therefore felt very kind of natural to me. 
but at the same time, you know, I mean, I don't want to get things wrong. And so there, I had to do more research about each one of each of the various different characters, um, especially having to do one of the themes in the book, I think, has to do with how our bodies constrain us. Um, Tahara, Seema's body does constrain her. I mean, her desires constrain her, but her body itself constrains her in the very final moments. And so, um, so there was, I'd say, a lot of trepidation writing about those issues just because I was like, I don't want to get things wrong. There'll be enough women to point out all the mistakes in the book. <laughs> um, so I can only say that I that I did it with respect and with love for all the women in my family who I admire. And, um, and I did want to represent the complexity of their lives. And um, so, and I hope, I hope the readers can see that and forgive me my mistakes. No, I'm telling, I know, I, I mean, I absolutely, I, um, I was saying that my mother was visiting me and she stole my copy of this book because it was on the coffee table and she started reading it and then tried to steal it when she was leaving the house. And I was like, no, no, that's my copy of the book. Um, and I think, you know, we're two totally different generations. And I think you really capture that beautifully. And I'm just so excited about this book, um, being out in the world and congratulations on just writing such a beautiful, I don't know, important book. I just feels, especially for me, I feel like I'm your, I, I, I feel like this is the kind of book I, I wish I could have read 20 years ago. <laughs> I wish I could have read a book like this in college. So, um, Really congratulations and thank you. And thank you to Green Apple Books for hosting this. Um, I think we're pretty close to the end of our time unless anybody has anything else to, I, I, and we wanna keep it. I know people have dinner and other things to get to, so I, I don't wanna keep anyone over, but thank you so, so much, Les. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. And uh, thank you, Green Apple Books too. You were it is i wish i could be there i've walked those aisles so many times and i can see them and i wish i could have been there so no, i wish we could all go browse now <laughs> but everyone should go buy a book <laughs> yeah yeah we, we of course want to thank the authors too here at green apple books um it was a super interesting conversation thank you so much nina and Avaz. Um, thank you to everyone who came out tonight, who tuned in. I mean, not came out, of course, can't come out, but thank you everyone for tuned, that tuned in. Um, of course, um, Radiant Fugitives is available here, so please buy it. You, you can um, place an order online and come pick it up, or you could just come into the store, either way. Um, yeah, H have a great night, everyone, and yeah, take care. <laughs>